Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Probably ask why I'm sighing right there. Well, today it's going to be just me. Also sighing because I just started our Twitter account. And it's already been a dumpster fire of messages and, yeah, hate towards police. So, fun. But if you guys want to follow us on there and support the program, please do so. You can find us on Twitter, at Point Man Podcast. And you can find us on Instagram as well, at Point Man Podcast. Basically, just wanted to start the account to hopefully get on another platform. I want to stay away from Facebook personally as much as possible. And, yeah, just to hopefully increase the spectrum uh, spectrum of our audience. The uh, Just hopefully increase the audience level or audience viewership for our podcast. We have almost 2,000 downloads, which, you know what, I think that's pretty good. So we're going to keep it going. I really don't care about the numbers. Just do this as a hobby. Also, it's pretty much at that point, that point in time where you guys are listening to other podcasts and you start hearing sponsorships. Guess what? We're going to be having one on the show soon. Uh, on the show soon. Chop Fit, if you guys haven't heard of them, they are mon- multifunctional equipment uh, with a packable design for training at home or on the go. Uh, the Chopper offers flexible weight loads and a durable build to withstand the toughest workouts. You can also download the Chop Fit app or app, excuse me, and yeah, they have some good workouts on there. You get the Chopper or the Chopper Pro. The Chopper is, actually both of them are, basically just rubber axes. Uh, the Chopper comes, I think it's about 16 pounds, and it's good for cardio workouts, whereas the Chopper Pro is 32 pounds and is good for strength training. I like them because you know what? One of the points of this podcast, or one of the main things I want to get across, is working out. Uh, obviously, I'm not in the best shape, all right? But I have that dad bod with no kids. So I wanted to create an environment where working out was seen for more than just the physical aspects of it. I wanted to create an environment where working out was talked about just as much for the mental aspects as it is for the physical aspects. Obviously, it increases the uh, blood flow to your brain, the oxygen flow to your brain, and gets you out of that headspace that you might be in at that point in time. You know, one of the other things I always say, and I hear people talk about it when I went, when, excuse me, when I went to counseling, it was one of the things that the counselor talked to me about it, or the brain mechanic, as I kind of like to call them. You know, getting out there and getting out of your head and into your body when you're going through those dark times in life or when you're feeling, you know, like shit mentally. Get out there. Do some sort of fun exercises, okay? These guys have great uh, training programs, especially if you're new to working out and you don't really want to do it. You can crush a 15-minute chopper workout. I don't know what else they call them, but that's what I'm going to start calling them. Uh, You can crush a 15-minute workout with them, get the blood pumping, get get that... uh, that blood flow to the to your brain go and the oxygen flow to your brain. And yeah, it's just a good it's a good overall uh, program that they that I think they have, especially for beginners. So you guys can go on chopfit.com and shortly we'll be having a Point Man Podcast promo code, which I'm pretty excited about our first one. But yeah, go on go on the website and check out their deals. I know that they have a Black Friday deal coming up as well. If you even if you're looking to warm up these guys offer great workouts for that. If you're looking to warm up to get into that, you know, that uh, workout for the day, go here, get one, and get moving. And secondly, the, before we get into today's uh, interview with James, I want to talk to you. This episode is going to be coming out on the, probably the uh, Friday before Thanksgiving, and with the dumpster fire and shit show that 2020 has been for most people i just wanted to talk to you guys you know get out there and make sure you're checking in with those friends and family uh it's been a pretty tough year for a lot of people out there even if you may be thinking that somebody is doing well because they're posting all these happy pictures and whatnot on facebook or any sort of social media uh, get out there check in with them hey if you know somebody is away from family during the holidays reach out to them. You know what? 
nothing sucks more than being by yourself uh, during holidays. So if you know that one of your coworkers uh, is not going to be able to make it to a friend or family's place for dinner, your governors may be saying to not have as many people over for Thanksgiving as normal. But if you are having a Thanksgiving that is, let's say, smaller in size than what you normally would uh, be having, invite them over. You know, we're all being safe. Everyone's washing their hands, okay? Make them a meal. Bring it over to them. Just check in with everybody. Make sure everyone's hanging in there. It's getting towards that holiday season. And for most people, holidays are a very happy thing. Uh, But let's not forget that uh, for a lot of people, it is not. And that seasonal depression is about to start kicking in soon. So just making sure that uh, that everyone is checking in with their friends and loved ones uh, during the holiday season. On today's episode, I'm going to be talking with the founder of the Unified Sports and Entertainment Security Consulting Company. He's also been recognized by Security Magazine as one of the most influential people in security in 2017. James wrote a book called What's Your Plan, which you can find on Amazon, and which covers a step-by-step guide to keeping your family safe during emergency situations. Basically, guys, uh, it's a book that opens up to your mind into what you should be thinking uh, when you're going out and bringing your family different places. Do you, do you guys know where the exits are? Uh, Can you recall what your child was wearing that day in case they go missing? Stuff like that. What's your plan as a blueprint for personal safety? Specific chapters focus on sports entertainment venues, special events, malls, shopping centers, workplace violence, and so on. James has over, I think it was over 21 years in law enforcement and retired as a missing missing persons detective out of uh, the New York City area and then went back to school after retirement. So we get into a lot of the challenges of post-retirement life. And here we are. James, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, John. Thank you. Oh, thank you for coming on. Oh, James is a best-selling author, and the name of the book is What's Your Plan? And he has over three decades of experience in the security industry and is considered a foremost subject matter expert on event security. Uh, James is a retired detective from Nassau County Police Department in Long Island, Long Island New York. Uh, having served 21 years in law enforcement and retiring as a missing persons detective from the uh, from the PD. And uh, after that, he went on to uh, earn his Master of Science degree in sports management from Adelphi Adelphi University. Is that how you pronounce it? Adelphi University. Adelphi University in 2012 uh, and uses his degree in experience in law enforcement uh, to and actually started as a founder and president of Unified Sports and Entertainment Security Consulting uh, based out of North Carolina. And basically that is just to, uh, you, you want to explain it, uh, what the uh, the the purpose of the, the career that you started, James? Second sure, career. John. Thanks so much for the opportunity to have the conversation. You know, as you mentioned, three decades in, you know, law enforcement, consulting, security. I decided to go back to school and pursue a postgraduate degree at Adelphi, as you mentioned, and, you know, just spending, you know, two decades in law enforcement trying to figure out exactly what I was going to do as I transitioned into my second career. So, you know, being out of college for over 20 years, you know, just having the courage, uh, my wife was supporting me to go back and continue my education. So uh, subsequently I had gone to an open house over at Adelphi in Garden City, New York, and I spoke to, you know, the, uh, the professor for the program and he encouraged me to take a look at sport management. And so at 46, I decided to go back to school while I was still active law enforcement, you know, wife, two kids, you know, full-time position with the PD. And, and going back to school really was a challenge to learn how to study. Imagine. Yeah. And so uh, it was extremely gratifying to, you know, earn my degree because it was something I had talked about for quite some time. And, you know, I'm really satisfied career-wise that I did that. Yeah. it's That's something that, you know, a lot of people go back to school after they're like after the career and they're like, well, is it really worth it? Do I want to, do I want to just kind of settle down into retirement life or do I want to keep challenging myself? And that's something that, you know, I think people, when they leave their career, if it's, you know, if they're doing an early transition or if they're transitioning as, uh, as a retirement, you know, that to have that next mission in life, whether it's, it's, you know, starting a, another business or getting your degree and finally doing that. Cause some people have, you know, 
promise they're like you know they may have gone to school earlier in life and then stopped to start their career and then they just kind of fail at getting their uh, degree and i think that that's having the next mission in life and always challenging yourself is a good thing and it must have been must have been weird it, it, to be the older guy in the class with all the young, the younger kids at the time. It, it was definitely an adjustment. I remember I had finished a tour at, at the PD, and I remember literally running across the campus in Garden City to try to get into the classroom before the, the professor did the golf school. Yeah, we, we chuckle about it, but I, I would have certainly been embarrassed at 46 to be locked out of the classroom <laughs> yeah. by my sport management professor. So I, you know, I look back now and I laugh about it and I chuckle, but it really was, John, a, a very rewarding experience for me. And, you know, as I mentioned, just learning how to study all over again, but it really kind of opened the door for me uh, to to transition since 2011, 2012, and, and really changed the course of my life mm-hmm. in terms of the opportunities, you know, that I had because I went back to school and, you know, we were talking before, you know, obviously coming on the air, but we're seeing now around the world there's so much disruption in every security, vertical, higher education, corporate. But we're finding out now the importance of, you know, just being passionate about learning and upskilling and, you know, learning how to handle these challenges. Because I always talk about with uncertainty comes opportunity. So in light of this pandemic, certainly the worst pandemic in 100 years, we're learning how to communicate through, through technology, whether it be Zoom, whether it be these types of presentations. And there's a whole new entrepreneurial mindset, you know, that we're finding to connect with folks domestically, internationally. It's just a really exciting time in the world right now. It, it really is. You know, it's people say, thank God for COVID because you know what? It, it's, you know, obviously people are dying and I'm not saying it like in a, a it, it's a not serious sort of way, but this podcast is one of the ones that wouldn't have started if it wasn't for COVID. You know, there's plenty other other ones out there like you were, like you and I were just talking about. You said something that there was... 40% uh, of the podcasts out there are because of COVID that have started this year and how many of them, you know, wouldn't have started probably this one if it wasn't for it. So um, it's just that whole new medium of getting out there and connecting with people and how can we do it? It's a lot easier nowadays to, you know, I can put on a presentation from a, another state, if not another country, if I really wanted to and, you know, have that conversation with people out there. And I like it because, Let's for sake of argument, James. I probably would have never met you if I hadn't started this podcast. And it's that it's that whole new conversation from somebody I would never have met or never had the privilege of speaking with. And and that's what uh, you know. That's what I enjoy out of it. Yes, and, and the privilege is mine as well. And I believe we have a, a mutual friend that introduced us through Instagram. Yes, so yes, yeah. So there's different social media platforms. You know, I spend time on Facebook, primarily LinkedIn, mm-hmm. which has really afforded me an opportunity to connect with a lot of folks in, you know, retired law enforcement, active law enforcement. A lot of the work now, John, that I'm doing is in higher ed. Okay. So because of LinkedIn, I've, I've been able to connect with professors and, and sport management chairs and deans, people I really wouldn't have had a- access to aside from technology. Yeah. So that's, you know, you know it, opened up a conduit, a, an, an avenue of opportunity for me to have conversations just like this about, you know, writing curriculum and developing course content for undergraduate, graduate students who will be the future leaders, you know, that, that safeguard our nation's uh, stadiums, venues, and arenas, an area that, that I specialize in. So, yeah, I'm extremely thankful, you know, to have these opportunities. And as I've mentioned earlier, uh, I'm excited to see where the opportunities, you know, lie for all of us in terms of this mass, uh, you know, interruption with uh, technology moving forward. Yeah, and I, that that mutual friend is John uh, Guarnieri, and who, uh, yeah, he started Spear Talk podcast, and uh, John was like we were, uh, you know, like I had interviewed him for my podcast. It was, you know, he had spent a, some time in the Secret Service and just started, uh, well, his own show, uh, talking about different security uh, events and whatnot. That's kind of his specialty as well, and. Uh, yeah, definitely. It was a good conversation and, and to have with him. And I was, you know, he set me up with a few different interviews. And uh, yeah, it definitely looks like he's doing well for himself. So you spent 21 years down at, in Nassau County, right? Is that where you're from originally? Yes, I grew up on the North Shore of Long Island. Okay. Town called Port, Washington, Port Washington. So if you think back to uh, the great Gatsby with F. Scott Fitzgerald, 
Okay. Um, that's where I grew up as a kid. Really? Uh, that area. Yeah. So I grew up and, and then I subsequently had taken a few um, law enforcement exams and I scored scored uh, highly on the NCPD test. Uh, I, I didn't initially want to go into law enforcement. I thought maybe I would go to law school, quite honestly. Okay. But my brother, my older brother, Ron, he retired as a deputy chief from Fort Washington. He and I both went into law enforcement. He had encouraged me at the time to at least go through the physical, the psychological, just do the background, yep. uh, you know, examinations. And, you know, quite honestly, it was the best decision I ever made in my life. I spent 21 years in, in a very noble, obviously a very dangerous profession, but really taught me the love of public service. You know, going into the police academy, I, I never really had any experience being in the military. So it really kind of whipped me into shape, quite honestly. I learned really, really fast the importance about you know, just discipline and following through on things and, and understanding, you know, that there's a structure in place. And really the training that I received at Nassau County really propelled me throughout the course of my life and, and certainly is helping me now in my second career. How old were you when you first became a cop? I was 25 when I went into the police so, academy. Okay, so you had a little bit of experience and, you I know, did. in life and whatnot after graduating high school. Did you, uh, I already, did you go to college right after high school at all? I did. I did. I went to a local community college and I earned my associate's degree and then I worked and went to school. I finished my undergrad at Long Island University CW Post College. I had actually worked uh, for IBM in Manhattan okay. uh, for about a year as a marketing and sales um, assistant. I worked at Publishers Clearinghouse. So I had some some corporate experience, but subsequently I got the results from the NCPD and, and I and I did well and I still wasn't sure. And my brother encouraged me to look into it. And as I've mentioned, I'm really happy I did because I met so many wonderful people. And it, it really was um, an opportunity to, you know, learn about public service. And, and I continue that love of my public service today as we speak. That's awesome. That's awesome. Just continuing that career in whatever it is, having a next mission in, in, in life, you know, after a career, so after people retire, they kind of, I don't want to say fall flat on their face, but they can just, you know, easily sit down on the couch and, and not do much or if they're just getting out of their job and, you know, having that next mission keeps you going, keeps your brain sharp. It just, you know, I think it's, I think it's better for people to have that, um, which obviously you've certainly done for yourself. Now you spent how long uh, patrol? Did you go right from, you know, after the academy, which is how long down, down there? We went for about seven months oh, in wow. Nassau County. Okay. And then, yeah, and then I was assigned to the 3rd Precinct in Mineola. I was in patrol for a little less than five years. Okay. And I had the good fortune of going to Community Affairs, where I worked in the Police Activity League. Okay. And I primarily assigned to the 1st Precinct I worked in Uniondale. So I ran after-school programs to keep kids out of gangs. So it was really uh, based on, you know, preventing juvenile delinquency, and subsequently, I had an opportunity to uh, become an investigator in juvenile aid. And at that point, I, you know, it was kind of the rehabilitation side, family court. But I had an opportunity, John, to take an instructor development class um, at the police academy. I and did that's the same really thing. Where I, yeah, where my love of teaching took off. And so Robin Beckerman was my instructor, and he really set me on the right course. And we still stay in touch today mm -hmm. and so he's been following the work that i i'm doing but it was really that instructor development class that really um changed how, you know the course of my life in terms of teaching and wanting to you know um teach the future leaders i i had the good fortune of training over 500 police officers during my career at the, the academy and that was really just just an amazing experience i subsequently had gone over to missing persons and i worked there for a little while and but i you know i enjoyed being an investigator it was uh, challenging obviously at times but i really learned how to write because uh, i was really um, learning how to become an investigator the importance of detailed facts mm -hmm. and making sure my cases were nice and tight and and you know just very organized paying attention to detail and that's really where i learned how to write if you will okay and so really my curiosity for learning um continued and and then I, you know, obviously went back to school. And so I continue to write. And, and, you know, as we mentioned from the onset, just the ability to have a sense of purpose in your life and just continue to learn. And so I find that to be, you know, extremely satisfying in my life right now. 
you know, having, being a teacher, I'm also an instructor and I kind of started off being an instructor in a different way. I started off with, uh, teaching active shooter classes, you know, going to schools or hospitals and, um, and teaching them on, you know, safety and how they can better prepare themselves and making themselves sort of, or being a, a hard target or making themselves into a hard target, you know? And so that's where I got my love for teaching and instructing was just kind of seeing, I remember the first class I was, and I didn't know this at the time, it was 150 teachers that I was in front of for being the, for two school districts and I was teaching active shooter and I wasn't prepared for 150 people, but I did, I did well with it because number one, that's what I, that's what I love teaching. I love making people, you know, being able to depend on themselves because when the police are called, generally the incident's going to be over by the time we get there. So we're not going to be there when you need us the most. And I like being able to help people uh, through those difficult times, telling them what they can do, what they should do and, and whatnot. And, you know, I just love seeing that transition from people having questions in the beginning of what do I do in this to people being empowered at the end. And so that's where I've gotten my love uh, of teaching for. Um, but, you know, always being a student, always being willing to learn. You can always go to, I'm being on the SWAT team and there's, I've already gone to my SWAT training. I've already instructed other classes. I've, I've done a lot of uh, SWAT related activities, but I have no problem with going to a SWAT related class in a different area of the country because you know what? I'm always, I'm always a teacher and always a student. I'm always willing to learn you know, I'm, I can always pick up something from somebody else in just the way that they're teaching. You know, what it just opens my my mind to a, a different way of thinking, and I think that that's people you know need to have that. And I and it sounds like you you're, if you feel the same um, that you know you're, you're kind of always willing to learn from others as well. And you obviously you could have you know stopped your career and kind of gone into like the, the policing side of things and for your post, uh, your post retirement career, but you went in back to school and you were able to learn from others and just kind of pass on that knowledge as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, you know, obviously I, I try to see things from multiple angles, but, you know, cer certainly having the ability to just look at the world and see in, in one, in one respect, it's complex, but it, in another respect, it's it's exciting, John. Yes. In terms of you know, people talk about this being, you know, the the fourth industrial, you know, revolution. So we're going to see, you know, post COVID, and as you mentioned, we've lost a lot of good people in this, and it's you know, our hearts and and thoughts and prayers go go mm -hmm. out to everyone that's been affected by this. But we look at you know just the monumental shift in in technology and learning, and there's so much you know information out there. Of course, we have to. You know, obviously vet our sources properly and know, you know, where the information is coming from. But just in the short amount of time we're seeing now, just this pivotal change in learning. And, and it's something, again, we talked about just upskilling and, and having a sense of purpose, but just trying to, you know, see the world from multiple angles, see, see it from other people's um, perspectives and to understand exactly that we all have, you know, gifts, talents and abilities to share and, and the ability to work together you know, for obviously, uh, the common good. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Now your, your career, your second, uh, second career, getting into that with working with the unified sports and entertainment security consulting, uh, you guys kind of pride yourself on teaching the, uh, the staff of like going to a sports sporting venue or a concert arena or whatever it is. And you, you guys, you're, you're, you pride yourself on, teaching the staff over there to have a better uh, connection with the people, the concert goers or the people who are attending the, the uh, sporting event, right? Yes, that's true. And, and, and certainly, you know, sports security or sport venue risk management is an area that I never thought I would go into. And, and really back at Adelphi, one of my professors had asked me what I wanted to do with my degree. And I really wasn't sure. And he had put me in touch with a, um, a former NYP detective by the name of John Young, who had retired and went into his second career himself. And he was the, um, he still is, if I'm not mistaken, but he's with the New York Islanders in the NHL and he was their director of security. Okay. So as part of my, you know, classroom trip, if you will, in grad school, I went over to, um, the Coliseum 
uh, in Uniondale, and I actually saw the inner workings of the command center for the New York Islanders. And really, that's where the light bulb job went off for me. And I said, wow, I have this degree now, or at least I'm, I'm trying to earn this degree. What can I do with my public service career mm-hmm. and my love of sports? And that really was the impetus for me to go into event security. And since 2011, 2012, I've really just done a deep dive into learning about how uh, intricate and highly specialized sport venue risk management is. So to answer your question, yes, Unified Sports and Entertainment, we work on doing you know, uh, risk assessments and we work on training event staff, the frontline gatekeepers for stadiums, venues, and arenas. Mm-hmm. We try to give them the skills, whether that be verbal de-escalation, threat and behavioral analysis, giving them that situational awareness. Uh, certainly you throw in a pandemic now, so we talk about all the uh, protocols that are being instituted inside stadiums in light of COVID-19. So there's a lot that goes on, but I feel it's a very interesting field. And and certainly once we do get the FDA-approved vaccine, the confidence for society will increase and, and subsequently we'll see that we can transition fans back into venues more confidently because we've instituted these safeguards to keep people safe while they're attending you know, uh, sports venues. Yeah, I think the biggest thing I, that I see out of that is the the de-escalation, obviously being police officers, and that's kind of the the word or one of the words that has been one of the hot button topics this entire year for police officers, and you know I can say security as well. But what do you guys teach, or I don't know if you want to get into how you teach it, but how do you how do you get through to your employees or the the people that you're instructing about de-escalation? Is it for you, is it more of de-escalation of a subject or a person that's attending the 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 event that's intoxicated or something like that? It, it could be. That's, okay. well, that's one potential scenario. But we, we want to bear in mind, John, that there's all you know. There's a few different types of staff members that work inside stadiums. They're in-house, mm-hmm. meaning they work you know exclusively for the venue. Example: In 2012, I helped open the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. So I was with AEG, so we had our own in-house security. I was part of the original supervisory staff that opened that building, billion-dollar building in Brooklyn, which was a tremendous honor. But we also were working with a contract security company, Securitas. Yep. So we do have what you would call a hybrid, where we have in-house, we have a third-party contracted security company, and then we'll have active law enforcement. You know, As an example, we had the NYPD. Uh, in Brooklyn. So understanding who those key stakeholders are and what are the advantages of in-house as opposed to third-party contract security. Event security tends to have a higher turnover. So we want to be cognizant of, you know, proactively training staff, as you've mentioned, in verbal de-escalation as an example. So, you know, during an ingress screening, we're screening fans as they come into the venue. We want the staff to be aware of their surroundings they may uh, obviously deal with uh, a potentially hostile patron on the way in. So they have to, you know, obviously understand verbal de-escalation, how they treat people with dignity and respect. And typically that works eight out of 10 times, Yeah. you know, when you show empathy. Uh, so, you know, verbal de-escalation can be applied to not only law enforcement, but also venue stadium staff inside stadiums, venues, and arenas. So uh, a lot of it has to do with just proactive training. Uh, on the ingress, uh, verbal de-escalation, as I mentioned, situational awareness, and those uh, you know important communications between the venue frontline staff and the contracted law enforcement, you know that that are assigned to work stadiums, venues, and arenas. So it's an it's an ongoing process. Um, certainly, if I wrote a a procedure today, uh, we may change it in three months, right? Yeah. With all the challenges that we're seeing, and we really didn't think much about aerial assaults uh, until the Vegas shooter came. Uh, the Black Swan out of the Las Vegas shooting, 32 floors up, a deranged shooter shooting into a confined space. The sports security playbook had changed drastically, you know, post Boston Marathon, and now you you throw in an, an aerial assault. The fast forward the clock until you know 2020, and we're looking at pandemic planning for stadiums and these arenas. So there's there's obviously a litany of challenges, and and as I've said to you before, we went on the air. Once we get the vaccine, John, we're gonna go back. Unfortunately, go back to those same challenges that existed prior to, to COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah. This, the past decade has definitely changed a lot for even law enforcement security and just the different threats that we are facing. And, you know, it's, uh, 
yeah, the, the, we always have to be on our toes and ever evolving and, and stuff like that. And I think it's good that, you know, there are people out there who are actually go out there and instruct like these companies like Securitas and, and whatnot. And cause I don't, you know what, I, I, for lack of better knowledge, I don't know, call me dumb or whatever, but I kind of thought that, you know, they just got hired and did, there wasn't really any formal training with, uh, with being a security officer. And, and so I'm glad to hear that, uh, that actually does happen. So. It, it does. And, it, and it's something that we, we you know, want to have those conversations with venue ownership because unfortunately, and you know, this in, in your law enforcement career, uh, it's very hard to put a price on the value of security until unfortunately something really bad happens. Yep. And then, so, so sport marketers don't understand the intrinsic value of being proactive until they end up in court, let's say, as an example, explaining, you know, during a litigation process that they skimped on security, you know, case in point, the Brian Stowe case with the Los Angeles Dodgers in 2011, mm -hmm. you know, where he, he, you know, the Brian Stowe was one, one one missing, that, right? Well, no, this was, this was an opposing fan and uh, he was uh, un unfortunately, um, you know, beaten up rather severely and put into a coma. And subsequently they brought in some subject matter experts to, to pick apart the, um, the gaps for the Dodgers security and, and the Dodgers were sued, you know, in that case were cited for a multi-million dollar judgment, okay. uh, which was rather costly. And certainly, you know, uh, Brian Stowe's life was tragic, uh, tragically altered as a result of that that incident. So nobody wants to be that that organization, John, that has to explain down the road why they skimped on security. So exactly, I, I think that no one wants to have that the Dodger rule or whatever it's called, or you know, no one wants to have anything named after them as to it, why everything happens. Exactly. And nobody wants to be known, you know, for for doing things the wrong way. So right. You know, when you throw in pandemics, when you throw in, you know, intoxicated fans, when you, you throw in errant drones, you know, over open-ended stadiums, when you look at the insider threat, a workplace violence scenario, when you look at a ransomware attack where someone, maybe a, a bad actor could, you know, obviously, um, you know, get inside a, a stadium's infrastructure, you know, and, and cause havoc or, you know, a data privacy issues. You know, there's a lot of very interesting technologies that go into venue security. For instance, uh, iris scans, and, and you know this in law enforcement, but mm -hmm. license plate reader technology. Yeah. If you're patrolling the exterior perimeter of a stadium and all of a sudden you get a positive hit on a plate, you know, maybe somebody's wanted by the FBI and they're inside that venue. That's a very, you know, useful tool for law enforcement. Um, but I also, you know, talk about the importance of response, responsibly monitoring social media inside the command centers, mm -hmm. you know, during these events, because if someone is, you know, on the radar screen and they're posting, you know, on one of the social media platforms that they want to, you know, bomb a particular stadium, that kind of information needs to be, you know, passed on to law enforcement so it could be vetted properly. Exactly. But we want to, you know, we want to be proactive in sharing that information, obviously with, you know, our key law enforcement partners that, that work inside these spaces. So, yeah, it's a very interesting niche. And, you know, a lot of uh, ex-military and law enforcement and a lot of students that I teach uh, in my universities are interested in the risk management side of keeping people safe inside stadiums. So, you know, I, I think it's going to continue to grow in popularity. And I think it's just a really neat, a neat field to look at in sports and entertainment. Yeah, it is. It's definitely, you know... <sighs> It's it's funny because you have that drunk fan who's let's say for sake of argument at a Patriots game or whatever it is, and they throw stuff on the field and they're kicked out for life. And you're wondering, well, how can somebody actually be banned from a stadium from life? And it and it and it does happen where people are you know the 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 boos get a hold of them and they do something dumb where they're they're banned. But there's a lot of security layers within large concert venues or stadiums that that pe that the general public is not aware of that you know can pick somebody out of a crowd um especially for a higher end let's say like the dnc or rnc when those get back to fruition you know that there's a lot of security features that are out there that the general public isn't aware of and that they can pick people right out of a, cl a crowd and you know letting letting the law enforcement know where everybody is um but yeah so yeah. Mm -hmm. Can Absolutely. You, yeah. What was uh, what was the hardest thing you know after leaving your career in law enforcement and starting this this company? What was was there a, a 
did the police department help you at all actually in that transition or was it kind of your cop on Friday and then Monday you're all done? Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it really is a huge adjustment psychologically, you know, the camaraderie that you and I have, mm-hmm. I mean, we never work together, but obviously we're having a conversation because we have similar career paths. Exactly. You don't, you don't really get that in the private sector unless somebody is ex military retired law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. So I, I really do miss, you know, my brothers and, and sister officers that I worked with for 21 years. I'll never have that kind of camaraderie again. However, you know, um, leaving and transitioning also opened up me to a whole world of opportunities that I never would have experienced had I had I stayed in law enforcement. And a whole new world of challenges. So, a whole new world of challenges. So, so my my love of public service continues. To answer your question, it's really incumbent upon everyone that's listening right now that's still active law enforcement to really think about, you know, where you want to be. You know, and and when I first started, I thought I was going to do 32 years. And, of course, I got five or six years on the job. And I was thinking, well, maybe, you know, I'll go back to school. I started teaching in the academy. And next thing I know, John, I I was halfway done. I had 10 years in. Yeah, and I said, "Wow, can you imagine in ten years I can actually, you know, vest out or, <laughs> or be retire done. And, and do something else?" And, yeah, that's where know, I am a, right now. I have ten years yeah. in, and it's like, man, do I stick it out for those ten more in this environment, or you know, what do I do? And it's kind of I, I understand that that mental process, a mental thought you have going on or had going on. Yeah, yeah, and so you know, you you think about your world of policing today, and and how how much more difficult it is and, and not that it wasn't dangerous when I police, but, but certainly in light of just what's happening, you know, politically here in the U S and, and, you know, macroeconomics and climate change and everything that's happening that obviously, you know, uh, recruitment is down and it's very difficult to recruit, you know, folks to go into public service. And so we, you know, we have to kind of take a look at, the future leaders that will go into law enforcement and, and certainly if you're in there is to to properly prepare yourself, you know, psychologically, physically, you know, financially. You wanted to, to go back to school like I did, but have a, a plan in place. And if you want to stay and move up in the ranks, you know, sergeant, lieutenant, captain and, and go the administrative route, by all means, you know, I would encourage you to do that. But if you're looking maybe to, you know, do something else after 20 years, it's to start to put kind of the, the wheels in motion during your career. If you can mm-hmm. afford to, you know, get your credentials, I'm involved with ASIS, but certainly the CPP. Uh, there's a lot of different credentials you could do. I, I decided to go back to school, which is something that was helpful to me. Uh, just this morning before we got on the air, I was actually in, in a conversation with a few universities. I'm thinking about doing my doctorate in education. Awesome. So, if I, yeah, so thank you. So if I can do that part time and, and still manage to put two kids through college and keep my wife happy. <laughs> the life, life is good. Yeah, right. But, you know, for me, it's just I just love to learn, and and so you know, at fifty five, you know, just continuing to you know try to stay as sharp as I can, and so for me, education is a lifelong process, and so I would just you know, everyone out there is to just have a plan, talk to you know folks like myself, you know, that are kind of going through the career and transition, whatever I could do to help out, talk to you know, obviously you know, people inside your agency to see what they're doing and just get a sense of where you may want to be. Uh, because you, before you know it, John, you're going to hit that 20 year mark and you yeah, say to yourself, well, now by. I can leave, you know, or 21 years, depending on your agency. Yeah, now my, I can leave. my dad yeah. always taught me growing up. He's like, you know, when you're, when you're zero to 20, it goes by in 20 years, zero to 40 it goes by in the blink of an eye. And I'm 33 now. And, or excuse me, Zero to twenty goes by in twenty years. Twenty to forty goes by in the blink of an eye, and yeah. you know, being thirty three now, it's my dad. You know, dad, you were right. It de- definitely it, uh, it flies by, and you know, having you get a start within your career. You know, literally, if it's sitting down on a piece of paper and writing yourself a resume of what you've done in your career and building upon the experiences, the different certifications that people have, do that. You know, what at least gets it on a paper of what you're working with and what you can do. And always, like you said, being a lifelong student is one of the things I recommend to people. Always never stop reading. I've, I've stopped you know, lately just because I've been busy, but never stop reading and developing yourself. And that's kind of like the, the one of the 
things that I try to, you know, pass on to people if I can is, you know, always try to better yourself, whatever it is, seek new challenges and new improvements. And I think one of the things that you brought up, uh, kind of not even knowing that you brought, that you probably did was having a partner in life that supports you and, you know, keeping each other happy and, and having one of those things just like, you know, push you through life. And I think that's one of the, uh, goals. If, if people are looking to, do that and start and go back to school and start a second career or a new career, like talk it out with your partner because you know what, if she's not happy and because you know, it's for whatever reason, it's not going to be worth it in the end. In my opinion, you can always, you know, work on what you whatever you have to work on and then go back to school in a couple of years. But having that stable foundation to go back and forth is probably one of the, the most important things. If you ask me that somebody can have and, and do for themselves. I would agree. And, you know, law enforcement is, is complicated enough. Exactly. So to have things kind of, and then you throw a pandemic in the middle of everything. Yeah. But, to have, you know, to have that stable home front, uh, because the officers are dealing with a lot of stressors, you know, uh, obviously some PTSD, there's just a lot that's going on. And so, you know, we, you know, obviously employee assistance in your agency, but certainly, you know, if you need to talk to somebody, uh, please do. Yeah. Uh, did because, you guys have you know, any was it outward that was it when you were on duty was the department uh outward and saying hey if you guys need help then come out to a counselor or we have counselors that we can use or was it more of the the cr- uh, critical incident stress you know sort of counseling that was the only stuff of it that they had to offer well they had both actually okay. so if you were obviously involved in, in some kind of shooting situation you know the department would actually send their team out to do the initial investigation but from a psychological standpoint, there was definitely resources there for you to speak to, you know, um, and which I think is very, very important. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we want to be, you know, mindful of, you know, unfortunately the suicides and, and mindful of the mental health for our nation's law enforcement. Um, but yeah, obviously these are very, very difficult times. And so we're having a change in the White House. Uh, there's a lot of changes going on, you know, uh, domestically and law enforcement is, is very, very complex, but I think it's important that that the officers and the agencies get the resources they need to be the most successful they can, you know, at doing their jobs. Exactly. So, I think it was yeah. 2019. It's kind of one of the reasons why I started the podcast is, you know, I've had a few friends who have, uh, you know, taken their own life. And in two, I think, I believe it was 2019, it could have been 18, uh, but it was just over 228 officers or 200, I think it was 228 uh, to be exact, officers that had you know, been reported by bluehelp.org. I'm not, I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar with their organization, um, but that had been sub- subsequently had taken their own life and that had surpassed the number of officers that were killed in the line of duty for that year. And, you know, why is that? And it could, it could be a, a, f- a few different reasons. Obviously, it's, it's a new organization that's reporting these numbers. And did they just discover that? So and so that, and did they just discover in 2019 that so and so in 1967 had shot himself in their, you know, who was a police officer, and they're just now reporting it as a as a suicide? And I think that when I became a cop in 2010, uh, it was there was still there still is a stigma, but even back then, I was being trained by guys who were, you know men and women who were got hired in 85, 87, 90. You know, right, right around the same time that you were, and there was still that stigma of you don't need to go talk to somebody. You don't, don't go do it. They're going to take your gun. They're going to, you know, take your badge from you. You're not going to become a cop. And there's like, how do I say it? Can can you be trusted? And that is the complete opposite of what it actually needs to be. I look at somebody who's out there getting help for whatever it is if it's a a bad home life and they're getting help or if it's substance abuse or you know just because that they've been involved in numerous uh traumatic incidents and they actually need to go get help as well that's fine because you know what the person i'm not a, i'm not worried about the person who is going out there and seeking mental help uh mental health help from a counselor whether it's a form of a friend counselor who's just meeting you out for coffee and sitting there and, you know, having a, a cup of coffee with you as you're talking about what's, what's bothering you. Or, you know, if you're actually going to seek, uh, you know, a psychiatrist, I'm not worried about that person. It's the person that has the smile on the face that is always happy and then isn't getting the help that they need, that we all know that they need. You know what I mean? And so 
I think that uh, that's kind of one of the reasons why I uh, have started this podcast is to, to do my part and end that stigma. Because, you know, when I looked at George, the George Floyd incident and I watched Derek Chauvin without getting into the tactics of it and everything like that, I looked at the, the video and I saw the possessed look in his eye. And I don't know what kind of uh, training he had received. I don't, I don't, I'm not here to get into it, but it, to me, it looked like he had something else going on in his brain and it was there the resources for him to go out there and you know get that get that help and so starting this podcast ending that stigma breaking down the stigma getting rid of it i don't care who you are if you if you need help go out and, and go out and, and seek it so that's basically the, sorry for that rant but that's no, no, and, and, and really you know maybe maybe years ago it was it was viewed as a, as a sign of weakness as you've mentioned but it really is a sign of strength yeah. Knowing, you know, we're not robots, we're human beings. We have our ups and down days, but, you know, agencies, you know, or your, your partner's having a, having a bad day. You just try to, you know, um, let them know that you're there for them and that ultimately there's somebody in the agency that can help them out. Cause as you've mentioned, you, you really don't know what's going on in someone's life. Uh, and ultimately we want, we want the officers to, to be in the best position, uh, positions possible when they go out and patrol you know, physically, psychologically. Exactly. And so, you know, and so it, it really becomes an officer safety thing, right? For your partner, if they're not really where they should be. Correct. Um, because you don't want to jeopardize your partner's life. But at the same time, you, you want to be, you know, be able to um, reach out for help if you need it. So it's, it's an important conversation. I appreciate you bringing it up. Hopefully everyone that's listening realizes, you know, that you're not alone and that ultimately, you know, there'll, there'll be somebody there to help you out if you're having some difficulty. Exactly. You know, I'm not, I'm not afraid to admit it. And I've talked about it in previous podcasts. I've seen three counselors, mm -hmm. you know what, because the first two didn't work. It didn't, didn't jive, didn't click. The guy, one of the guys was looking out the windows. I was trying to talk to him like, okay, then mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think this guy remembers my name if I asked him right now. So mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those things there, you know, what? especially if you live in a rural, rural area, I'm trying to get them as a sponsor, but betterhelp.com is one of those mm -hmm. uh, resources that are out there for people to go out and use and, and whatnot. I don't care if you're a cop, firefighter, EMT, or if you're a nurse, or if you know what, I don't care who you are. If you need help, get a hold of us. We'll get a hold of, uh, you know, uh, a person in your area that can help you as well. So, exactly. um, yeah. So, yeah. So you wrote the book, What's Your Plan? And that's kind of your, how do I put it? It's, it was a kind of a guide to how can you, make yourself more of a hard target, right? More of a, you know, what you should you be doing or looking for when you're outside in the public. And, and I think there was one of the things like we talked about was, can you remember what your, what your daughter or your son was wearing if they went missing, you know, can where are the exits? And do you want to get into that a little bit if we can? Yeah, sure. Just, just, to, just kind of a quick overview. I, I actually wrote the book based on something my son said to me. We were visiting a mall here in, in North Carolina in the dorm area, and the lights went out. We were up on the second floor, and he said something to me, John, that, that the little hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and we exited the mall. And, of course, everyone was looking down at their smartphones in, in complete darkness, completely desensitized to the world around them. And, you know, on the way home, we had a conversation, you know, on on how we felt about that situation. How and, old was he? Uh, well, he's... He's 16 now, so okay. I wrote the book three years ago. He's about 13 and change. Okay. And so, uh, you know, from the mouth of babes, as they say, but, you know, when, when it, you know, spending 30 years in law enforcement, you know, working the aftermath of 9 11, all of my training, you know, everything I've, I've done in public service, but when something comes from your own family member, uh, it really, really threw me off and I felt, you know, compelled to do something about it. So, we sat down at the, the dining room table. We had a conversation on what we would do, kind of processing what happened and how we would kind of react to a crisis situation. And that was really, you know, what inspired me to write the book, just based on something that my son had said to me. What was it that he said to you? He said to me, hey, Dad, what happens if, uh, you know, somebody comes in here and shoots this place up? Okay. You know, this was before a lot of... Uh, the rash of school shootings that we had around the United States in the last couple of years. And, you know, so for him to say that to me, you know, wise beyond his years, you know, I, I just, I just felt that, uh, you know, 
families in particular should have the conversation and really just kind of know what to do step by step. Yeah. And have that conversation and just empower one another of what to do. Yeah. Yeah. You know it based on your training, but, and you said it best beginning of, of the show. By the time the good guys get there, most of the bad stuff is over with. Yeah, and that's always the hardest thing for me to explain to people when I'm putting on training. It's, you know, you pay us all this money and, you know, I'm not getting into like defunding the police or anything like that, but you you pay us all this money to to be there for you when when you when you we are needed, when you're in in danger and in trouble, but statistics show we're not going to be. We're going to be uh the person if for sake of argument, if it is an active shooter is going to either shoot themselves by the time they hear the sirens and we get there, or it's going to end however it ends before we get there. 90, 90% of the time it will. Okay. Right. right. And your training is, is tactical. So you're going to go down and, and obviously, you know, mitigate that threat. And I try to tell everyday moms and dads to, to have kind of a pre-planned response prior to law enforcement, I always say, obviously, if law enforcement's on the scene to be guided by what you tell us what to do, Mm -hmm. you're in charge of that scene, but it's those crucial, you know, five to seven first minutes as you're responding to that scene. Right. That as families, we've already had, we've already had the conversation. Our phones are fully charged. We know how to get out of the mall. We know how to get out of that movie theater. Um, We know that we're going to meet back at the car or at Starbucks because we've already had that conversation. And so, when you have that pre-planned mindset, you increase your chances of being not only situationally aware, but increase your, increase your chances of surviving the unthinkable because you're going to do something proactive as opposed to reactive. Exactly. You're going to operate yep, from a position of strength and not fear. And I think what happens is when people react from a position of fear, it's really defensive in nature and they just don't know what to do and they and they follow that herd you know, um, mentality. And it doesn't necessarily those mean that those people that are kind of exiting out that one door are leading you to safety. You no, know, I mean, you look at it, yeah. say, sorry to interrupt you, but you look yeah. at, um, and I, and I use this in all my PowerPoints and I got to use it again in another class I'm putting on. And I can't remember the, the station nightclub fire down in, uh, Rhode Island yep. back. And I want to say it was late, late nineties, early two thousands. Yep. Everyone went towards the front door but that's when it become became, excuse me, uh, let's say for sake of argument, overwhelmed by the amount of people who were trying to get out and failed and people who died inside that couldn't get out that front door because that was literally the only exit that they knew. And there were some other people who got out through side windows and indoors, but it's like you were saying, being prepared and knowing where you wearing where all the exits are. And some people call it, I don't know if they call it paranoia, but police officers always sit with their where how do we sit when we get to a restaurant with our backs towards you know the the the, uh the walls and whatnot but we're prepared and what's going on and we're always taking in that information of you know that people watching essentially and deciphering what's going on in the outside environment but knowing where the exits are knowing where uh yeah just how to get out of a building if something bad were to happen absolutely absolutely so is it it's more of a of a guide like you were saying towards the family member of how to uh make your is it your home as well does it include your house or no well i broke it down into to eight chapters for instance chapter number 1 is sports and entertainment venues so mm-hmm. if you went out to you know a boston bruins hockey game or a new york islanders hockey game as an example uh you'd read the chapter and just kind of pass the book around your family before you went out to the venue okay if you went to the place of worship there's a, there's a chapter on places of worship, you know, inside your corporate workspace. Obviously, we're working from home now in light of COVID-19, but at some point, we'll do a hybrid or we'll go back to working inside these spaces. So how do we deal with the insider threat? You know, what, what, what signs are we looking for? Those early attack indicators to violence, mm-hmm. you know, that we're looking towards. You know, so I broke it down. Ironically enough, uh, John, the book is 82 pages long. I did not plan it this way, but 82 was my shield number as a Nassau County police officer. Oh, so well, that's that awesome. Just kind, of, just kind of interesting how it turned out. But I broke, <laughs> broke it down um, to eight, you know, easy chapters, easy to digest, something that you could just read time and time again, just to increase the level of your situational awareness. And again, it's it's really simple to understand. I didn't want it to be 
you know, a, a security practitioner's, you know, text, if you will. I want it to be for everyday moms and dads mm -hmm. that don't have, you know, obviously kids in high school that don't have our level of training, but they can start to see the world, obviously, from one more than one perspective. They can look up from their smartphones and kind of, you know, see what's going on around them at all times. And again, just, just all about operating from a position of strength and not weakness. That's awesome. And you know what, like, uh, I think there's a few other people out there who, Say I don't know if uh, you've heard of a Mike Lover is a uh, former spe former special operations in the military and you know he started his own uh, company basically it's, you know places of fear people who are afraid get there from not being prepared and you're going to be fearful and like we were saying in a conversation last week it was you know when I'm going to do my job in the in the, the tactical environment I'm not afraid because I've run through. Numerous, numerous different situations that can happen in my own head. And I am, it's the same thing you can do in the outside world. And it, it's run through, hey, if I, if, if my little son, Joseph, you know, walks away, how am I going to get to somebody who can find him? How do we have a plan to meet if we get separated, all that sort of stuff. And I think that's, it's, it's definitely good to have for people who don't normally think that way in an everyday a scenario, whether it's police, fire, EMT, or just in some sort of tactical ex-military uh, sort of environment, for the people who are just the, the run-of-the-mill family to have that sort of guide, I think it, it is something that's that's great, and I'm glad you did it because not many people think that way, and I think we need to, as a as a country and just in general, always be aware of what where we are, what we're doing, do we have a place to go, and, and that's great. Yeah, no, thank you and for the positive feedback. And we, we've become a bestseller. And, you know, I, I consider myself a reasonably intelligent person. But when I wrote my first book here, I, I realized uh, <laughs> I've, I've got a lot of work to do because, you know, a lot of people ask me about writing a book, John. And, and it was really um, it was really a lot of hard work. I and, can only and, imagine, you know, and just and this is just another conversation that's with you, but an, an opportunity to kind of get the message out. Uh, you know, I've been on regional television. I, I, I've been on a lot of podcasts. And so, you know, burning the midnight oil, but all the work that goes on behind the scenes that you have to do as an author um, is just it's just a tremendous task. And so there's really no right way to do it. You can start Googling all day long and come up with, you know, helpful suggestions. But it's something uh, that I wouldn't change in a million years. It, unfortunately, uh, there's enough material that's happened since I wrote the book to write another book, which I'm considering doing. And I would encourage anyone that, that really wants to write to do it. I mean, you can self-publish. There's a lot of ways that you can do it. Is that, uh, how, you, that, is that how you did it? Do you self-publish it? Well, actually, in, in, in this scenario here, I actually um, I contracted with a book collaborator. So it's all my work, but um, my ghostwriter helped me organize my thoughts, which, you know, so it was kind of a, a team effort in terms of, you know, the structure of the book, but, you know, um, to make sure that obviously it's, it's proofread properly and, you know, uh, you just give it your best shot and you put it out there on Amazon or, you know, you market it on social media and you try to build, uh, you know, obviously, um, a fan base of folks that are interested in kind of the message that you're getting, getting out. So anytime on LinkedIn, I see a new author, I love to read like you do. So I, I try to support you know, folks that are writing books for the first time, because I know what it's like when someone supported me and I'm extremely grateful for that. And, and so, you know, the process continues, but I love to write and I love to share whatever knowledge I can. And, and obviously having the opportunity to discuss this with you on the podcast, again, helps, uh, you know, reach the largest audience possible. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. I appreciate what you've done. And it just seems like for a, a book that it's 82 pages long, it took you how long to, from beginning to end? Uh, it, it took about seven months. So you from, know, the, from the time you had the first idea of writing a book, well, not necessarily the idea, from the first time the pen went to paper and then until it was printed, it was seven months? About six, seven months. And again, that's between, you know, working with the book collaborator and my publisher who's based in Plano, Texas. Okay. Certainly, you know, I, I would just recommend if you're interested in writing to take your time. <laughs> you know, everybody, <laughs> everybody writes differently if you – if you're like me, you get up on a Sunday morning when the house is nice and quiet. You you make a pot of coffee and you start writing. Okay. And when you're in, you know when you're in that zone, you just you just do it until you can't do it anymore. Um, but we live in a world where we have so many distractions 
that uh, sometimes it's hard to sit down and just focus. So, you know, pick a nice quiet area, you know, whether it's at the beach or some some place in your home that's quiet and just put your thoughts, put pen to paper, as you mentioned. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, do what, what feels natural to you. And, you know, you will find what your genre is. You'll find your sweet spot for writing. And for me, it was just based on something my my son said to me. And now it's it's really created some amazing opportunities um, again, pre, pre COVID, but to speak around the country about the book, about some of the work that I'm doing in higher ed. Uh, so for me, it was really a, a game changer in terms of creating more opportunities for my business. And I'm really thankful, you know, for everyone that supported me because again, it's, it's a, a total team effort, John. You can't do it by yourself. There's always strength in numbers. And, and when you have, you know, people supporting you, encouraging you, it really goes a long way Definitely. making that impact. Definitely, definitely. If people want to look at your book and buy it, it's called What's Your Plan? And it is on Amazon. Is it any other uh, the major uh, bookstores or outlets right now as well? Sure. It's on my website, which is jamesademayo.com. And so you'll see the link for the book there. We're on Goodreads. We're on Amazon. You know, um, just, just getting the message out about What's Your Plan? Again, it's a step-by-step guide to keep your family safe during emergency situations. And so... You know, I appreciate everyone who's thinking about obviously supporting me. And, you know, I've been encouraged to write another book and I'd really like to do that uh, in some capacity. But, you know, moving forward now, you know, once we get past the pandemic, once we have the change in the White House, we're going to see what types of challenges we're going to have. So when you're out in those public places, again, you know, you're coming out of venue to be mindful that there could be some kind of civil unrest, a political protest. But You've already had the conversation because you're prepared with your family on how you're going to adjust to that kind of scenario. Exactly. Exactly. Always be prepared. You know, expect the worst, hope for the best, but just being, being prepared, have the conversation with your kids of, Hey, if we get separated, you know, number one, our cell phones are charged up. We have a plan to, uh, a plan in place, whether it's a nearby family member or a friend or a, uh, like you said, like I guess Starbucks or a fast food shop where we're going to meet in case something were to happen and just go from there. And uh, the one question I did want to ask you, James, is um, you said you worked the aftermath of 9-11. And I think, you know, with that being such a, a, a predominant historical moment in America, and I just I would like to hear about what you what you did about uh, after 9-11. And if you wanted to get into that at all, that would just be interesting to hear. Sure, sure. Well, September 9th is my daughter's birthday. So that Sunday, we actually had flown out to Southern California for a family wedding. Okay. Well, come Tuesday morning, like the rest of the world on the 11th, and just saw obviously the tragedy, you know, that came out of 9 11. And what was frustrating for me is I couldn't get back to New York for over a week or nearly a week. And so, you know, uh, all the planes were grounded. And so I was working in community affairs, as I mentioned, Mm -hmm. and we were responsible for transporting mental health professionals from Nassau County to uh, the Javits Center, as an example. Uh, We worked the INS building. I was with um, our Bureau of Special Operations, your tactical, you know, Mm -hmm. we were working with the SWAT team in the subways, uh, you know, post 9-11. So that was really my role was more uh, supportive in nature, working with, you know, multiple law enforcement agencies, transporting mental health professionals. Um, Obviously, just a very, very difficult time. I've lost some friends. A friend of mine was with the FDNY. Uh, we grew up. To do that. Yeah, thank you. He, uh, our parents were very close. He, you know, he lived out in Suffolk County. I lived in Nassau. He went into the fire department. I went into law enforcement. And unfortunately, he had finished his shift that morning. Was on his way home to Suffolk County. Heard what happened on the radio. Turned around and went back to the towers and never made it out. So uh-huh. really tragic situation. We all have, unfortunately, those those similar type of stories where we knew someone or a friend of a friend. And Mm so very, very difficult scenario. And so, you know, that was really my role. John was uh, in supportive nature. And, you know, I I will say that I mentioned to you earlier that, uh, you know, I have spoken around the country. So a few years ago, I I spoke at the Javits Center, the same building that I worked in post 9-11. So that was kind of emotional for me to present on event security, but be in the same building I had been in, you know, right after 9-11. So that just kind of brought everything back to me about how New York had changed. And so, you know, it's just uh, it's an experience that really, you know, changed the course of everyone's life, the world. And and now we're dealing with this pandemic. But hopefully, you know, we, we can work together and, and understand each other's differences and and just move forward as a society. Yeah, it's funny you say the Javits Center is my I'm still in the Army Reserves as a medic and my 
unit was down there this past year actually treating patients at the Javits Center. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just, yeah, funny you say that small small world sort of stuff. But small world. Yeah, yep. no, I definitely uh, appreciate your service. That's definitely, you know, something that I would have been aggravated if, if I just speaking from my my myself like you said the frustration of i flew out sunday tuesday this happens and i can't get back to to help right. out and right fortunately you were able to after that but you know any sort of help after 9 11 whether it was like you said transporting working with different agencies bringing people here and there just to get it done it, it that's that's service in itself and you know thank you for, for helping and and doing that and and I'm sure it was uh, greatly appreciated well, during that time, and it is now as well. So, all right, yeah, James, sure, do you, yeah. uh, do you have anything else you want to bring up or anything like that? Where can people find you on on uh, social media? Yeah. Great. So, so John, thank you for the opportunity, and and obviously we have a friendship, you know, forging forward. So oh, I, yes. I look forward to staying in touch with you and and supporting you and and the work that you're doing. Thank you. Not only is active law enforcement, but the entrepreneurial mindset that you have. I I you know, I encourage you to continue to do that. And so, yes, uh, jamesademayo.com. I'm on, you know, Facebook and LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. But I, I love having these conversations because we all learn from one another and everyone's listening out there to, you know, obviously it's been very, 2020 has been a very, very difficult time. <laughs> yes, it's been a, yeah, a year of a dumpster and, fire for everybody. <laughs> yeah. And it's just been something that uh, we're all kind of processing, you know, differently. But, you know, uh, love on your family, love on your neighbors and, and just, you know, if, if someone you're working with is having a hard day, just let them know you're there for them and, and that you can offer some resources. But, you know, everybody's having a tough time and everybody's dealing with this. And, and as I mentioned, you know, processing it differently. But we look forward to, you know, obviously, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's and, and 2021 with the anticipation of, you know, things getting better and us moving, you know, forward as a society. So thank you again, my friend. I appreciate the opportunity to have the conversation. No, thank you, James. I appreciate it. And I look forward to hearing from you again. <laughs> Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, guys. Hope you like the podcast. And, Phil, if people like the podcast or don't like it, where can they go? Uh, They can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, any place you can think of that you can listen to a podcast, whatever you use to listen to it. You can find us there. If you can't, let us know. Hit our DMs up and uh, slide into them. And we'll make it available if you want to listen to it. That's definitely, right. Definitely want you hearing it. Exactly. You guys can go on there and give us a zero, give you, give us a five. I mean, I say that we really don't care what you give us, but we kind of do because we want to put out a good product, a good show. Um, you know, if you have any good feedback or negative feedback, you know, tell us to stop doing this. I don't care. We're going to keep doing it. But constructive criticism, always welcome. Exactly. Exactly. If you guys want to follow us, you can do so on Instagram at Point Man Podcast where you can interact with us. You can send us, you can slide into the DMs. You can email us. It's pointmanpodcast at gmail.com. And you can leave us comments and whatnot. And like and subscribe uh, wherever you listen to those podcasts. And I would like to go and do an Instagram live. So. If you guys start following us, we'll do some Instagram lives when we actually have in-studio guests. I think that'd be something pretty cool to do. We do have a uh, a couple on-scene, on-location interviews. That's right, like tool time of home improvement. If you guys remember that from back in the day, we're going to be Point Man Podcast live in a few different locations. One's going to be Pipe Dream Brewery in Londonderry, New Hampshire. The other will be Donut Love in a new market and yeah if you guys like this go subscribe and thank you for listening